Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming here tonight live and thank you so much to those of you who will be watching on Catch Up. Um, you're listening to Finding the Why and today we have the amazing guest, Elfie Joey. Um, and it's an honour to have him this evening. So what is Finding the Why? Finding the Why is a community for artists coming together to build relationships and disrupt the elite systems that are within the art world. For artists by artists, hosted by professional artists Sarah Hardy and Kirsty Tebbs. Um, with a weekly live streamed podcast talking everything about art. We have guests, art challenges, current news, and so much more, and each week is different. And we like to choose the topics around what you guys want to hear. So if you have any topics you want us to discuss and find in the news at the moment, please send us a message or put it in the chat box and we will tailor it around that. So... I don't know if it's just been me. It's been such a crazy week. Um, how has your week been, Alfie? Well, uh, probably the most <laughs> weird I've ever had because I'm self-isolating for the first time. I've, I've survived the whole year and a half and gone into work and carried on doing lots of the things I normally do. And then my son got um, tested positive. So we then had to go and get a PCR test as a family. And then we, that's it, 10 days in uh, splendid isolation. So I've got all my radio kit in here. So I've been doing the radio show from home. Uh, luckily, this this tiny den of iniquity is so full of rubbish. It's brilliant with uh, soundproofing. So the, the, my boss said, it's unbelievably good, the sound you've got in there. I said, that's because it's full of junk. And it's, it's worked. So this is where I've been early in the morning and I, I wake the family up. When I go on air at six o'clock and I talk away till 10 o'clock and that's it. I've been doing the show from here. Ah, that's fantastic. I mean, what is family for other than to irritate the rest of them? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they agree. <laughs> Sarah, how has your week been? My week's been round again, um, to be fair. Um, apart from the usual work, um, I've been putting together an idea for creative wellness walks and also creative wellness retreats um, on Sardinia. Um, so I've been putting a lot of time and effort into that and kind of finalizing other submissions as well. So it's been a bit crazy, um, but how about you, Kirsty? Oh, it's in and out of it really. Um, like, like your son, Alfie, I got tested positive for COVID and so did my partner. We got quite ill a couple of weeks ago. And we're starting to find our energy back. So <laughs> I've been, I think in about the space of four days, I managed to get into exhibitions in London, Doncaster, uh, oh. Kent, North Devon. Um, so we've been, <laughs> so Boom. I'm starting the jer journeys everywhere. Honestly, it's been crazy the past few days. Um, so... <laughs> I think and did, today, did they all, sorry to interject, yes. did they did those exhibitions were they long in the planning or did they all just go doo, 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 come at once? No, they all came at once. Um Doncaster <laughs> one was uh, I got a phone call one day asking for my artwork. Um a little bit of hollapalooza around that, but I literally next day, well, within 12 hours, I had to mount a 2.6 meter artwork. Um, I was going to box frame it, but I decided I prefer sleep. <laughs> um, <laughs> shot all the way up to Doncaster, dropped it off, shot all the way back down. I'm from Hatfield, so that's about a three-hour trip either way. Um, and I've got <laughs> I've got the same length journey this Sunday going to Kent. So <laughs> very but busy week. You go, you've got to go where it is. Amazing. <laughs> um, <Need a> chauffeur. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah tonight we're talking about dual careering um, all of us have at least two different sources of incomes as with most of you who are probably watching uh, which isn't necessarily always a bad thing so we've picked out a couple of well really academic articles more than news articles um, about what is going on with this creative industry and this idea of dual careering yeah, so the first of which is kind of, as I say, it's more of an academic article and it's basically um, titled Who is Working Second Jobs in the, the Creative Industry? Um, now, it, it is kind of thought to be more kind of artists, music, um, musicians and actors. Um, and 
it stated that around 30% of the second careers in the creative and cultural industry, the second career will not be create, um, will not be creatively oriented. Um, and uh, opposed to that, there's kind of in the cultural industry, if people have secondary careers, that it's more, um, it is slightly lower at 20%. Um, but yeah, they're, they're saying why? Because kind of, I suppose, income's lower. And um, yeah, it, it's more a case of, you need that second career to support your aspirations. Um, there is a bit of controversy because of obviously kind of when you have two careers, um, if you've got a, a primary primary career that's not creative, that's very sapping on your energy. Um, and people start to regard your, your artistry, um, your art or kind of whatever kind of aspect you're working on as more of a side hustle. Mm. Um, which can be a problem because it, it, it can then become a bit harder to push. But, you know, that said, um, having two jobs, it has pros and cons to it. Um, as long as you're not, you know, as long as it's not burning you out, having the, the two careers and kind of, you know, making you give up and kind of feeling like you have to abandon your creativity because you're, 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 you know, your personal life suffering, your family suffering it can also feel quite liberating to have that and have the dual career going on and to have the choice and to have the, that diversity. I know um, we will be talking about an article um, just in, in a bit about um, a man who actually really, really thrives on having multiple careers. Um, and it's quite astonishing the way he's juggled it. Um, but yeah, so it's, I suppose, you know, what, what they were saying in this article is that the creative economy needs to be more centered towards geared towards taking into account the well-being of artists and kind of maybe kind of trying to restructure it um, to accommodate um, some semblance of sanity, I guess. But uh, yeah, really interesting um, read. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And I mean, not really surprised that the eight in fact I'm actually surprised that the 80 percent isn't higher um because so because it's just such a volatile career and just being in the creative arts especially in the pandemic right now everyone's had to go out and get a job in a supermarket or somewhere where there's going to be at least a little bit of security for a couple of months and I think if they did this um this survey now rather than a couple of years ago, how will the figures change? Like I can imagine that soaring up to like 95% because whether they were on furlough or whether not, it, it didn't pay the bills. And with that 30 to 20% being the second jobs creative, I think that would plummet even more to maybe even 10 or 5% because of that idea of being in supermarkets or covid testers or anything like that um but is it a problem or is it not having a job in another in another sector because you can everything is transferable skills whatever you learn somewhere you can put it towards your creative practice and get you to where you want to be um and that actually leads us on to the next one quite well um uh, it shows us um, why you should have at least two careers and you think of this headline I should have another job you kind of like gasp at it uh, but <laughs> actually I, I agree I agree with this title and it's been tracking the industry since the 1980s um, and done several surveys over the past 40 yeah 40 years um, because it is a volatile career and sometimes you need to take out that mind frame of two careers and put what are your sort how many sources of income do you have so whether you're painting you're painting art oh look you're working in a gallery you're curating oh look you're putting on exhibitions you're doing pr that's three different sources of incomes right there that's not necessarily three different careers that's all one career but you've got three different sources of incomes and I think that's what well this article really tries to uh, debate a little bit that maybe we should take away the idea of career and put in sources of income yeah absolutely this this guy actually um the author of this article he has 
um, four, four different careers actually. One's a corporate strat strategist. Um, another one is a US Navy reserve officer. Um, he's a record producer and an author. So it's just like mad, absolute madness how he managed us to kind of deal with all this. But I think he's just embraced it. And he said, I just make time. But it's kind of, I suppose it's quite, it, I mean, you can, you see people out there who, you know, are blessed with, with this gift of managing businesses and they do well, they thrive financially and everything. And they do, they just, the more they have on, the more they can do. And it, it's just like that time perpetuation. It's like, yeah, of course I've got time. I just make it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I give absolute props to him. I think I'd be a puddle on the floor if I was him. <laughs> but um, I, I could barely manage what I do now. Um, but I do it all seamlessly if I do say so myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, and our final article. Oh, dropping everything now. <laughs> Yeah, this is another academic article, and it's basically, um, again, about multiple job um, holding and artistic careers, um, and it, it, you know, it's based on empirical evidence. Um, but yeah, um, kind of using your creative skills out, outside of your practice, so applying them to other jobs as, as discussed in the last article, and kind of whether or not the second job is a necessity. Um, they kind of made um, they made a few examples, one of which was T.S. Eliot, who was apparently a bank clerk um, alongside his, you know, his career. So, um, yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, and, you know, some of the, the surveys, um, I think they've been some of this, this kind of stuff's been tracked since about 1983. So it people have had that awareness that for, for some time that, you know, being an artist isn't easy and it's not a case of you have that one career and you run with it because you're always going to have enough it it's it's quite widely known and it, I suppose you know yeah we, we've all felt it as artists that kind of you have this kind of this split path going on almost I guess but yeah it kind of um I think some of the variables have been living with partners um and you know your your housing situation and I suppose when you think about it, probably your upbringing as well, and what your experience was when you were growing up, um, which you know most of us take forward. It's like how hard do we really need to work to be artists? Not with respect of how how much do we paint, but I, I suppose it it's never really been looked upon outside as a kind of I don't know what am I trying to say here? <laughs> it, <laughs> sorry, um, it's like it's not an easy profession to make work solely. And I think that's kind of, you know, when you, unless you're a grandmaster, but we, we've covered that before as well, because we, we've seen how what they've gone without um, and very often artists don't make it till that they are no more, so. I mean, yeah, this is so true. And I think one of the best things about this article is it'll make you think and, if you look at some of these bigger artists, yeah, they've managed to make it, but what do they do that they don't tell us? Where else are they getting their money? Um, and where did they used to get the money before they were um, artists? I, like, I think that's incredibly fascinating. Uh, if any of you are into like the emo rock from the 2000s, uh, Three Days Grace, the lead singer, he used to be a bean counter. Like, I think that, <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, so, yeah, think, don't just think, oh, I've got a second career. I need to shove it in a cupboard whenever I talk to anyone that has anything to do with the creative sector and think, well, actually, how can I use it as my advantage? Because it's given me so much and it is a part of who you are. And it is all about how you've grown up. I mean, my dad was is a phenomenal hard worker and I'm a phenomenal hard worker or I like to think so um and slowing down sometimes you realize that you don't really need to put in that much hard work when you're not getting a lot out sometimes you need to draw back go back to the drawing board get on with your other stream of income and then you can come back with full spirit again um so yeah 
there was a really nice quote actually from the Kabir um, Seagal um, uh, um, article, and it's um, follow your curiosities, you will bring passion to new careers, more fulfilled, um, and end up doing all of them better, basically, which I really like. Um, and yeah, I suppose it's a perspective and an attitude to go if, if you are having to, you know, have that multiple income stream, then multiple jobs, it's it's nice to kind of um, an attitude to go forward with, I guess. Mm. That's true. Oh, you need a bit of positivity. Um, <laughs> right. How do I Lots. stop this? Technology again. <laughs> it never works for me. <laughs> 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 um, honestly it will one day probably the final day we do this in like years to come <laughs> um so yeah why do we do streams of incomes why why do we need the creative side into us and with that comes quite a few uh problems such as funding how do you fund being an artist <laughs> this is a big topic and you could spend weeks just learning about it and there's so many different ways of funding your different incomes whether it's yourself with another stream of work like a chef or bartender on nights or a day job or whether you go for loans or funding but nowadays it's so hard to find funding without any strings attached you get the England um Arts Council England, let's get the name correct. <laughs> it's not just England. <laughs> um, with that, you still have to do a lot of paperwork to prove that their money has gone to a good thing and that you have actually carried out what you've managed to carry out or if you have to do better. Um, you go, Prince's Trust is another big one for a lot of um, younger people, but that can be seen almost like a loan. And a lot of places you either have to give a percentage of funding by yourself or you have to pay it back. Yeah, it is, it is difficult. I actually thought, um, I don't know if anybody's watched um, Alfie Joey's TEDx talk, but it's amazing and it's all about changing lanes. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I found so inspiring and, you know, kind of having spoken to Joey quite a bit and sorry, Alfie quite a bit, <laughs> and then watch the TEDx is like, he aligns so perfectly with this podcast and what it's about. Um, so I thought because we're talking kind of multiple careers here, it'd be really interesting to kind of look at the lessons and the skills that we've acquired through changing lanes, through having multiple careers. Um, and I just thought, yeah, uh, I, I don't know if you want to kick us off, Alfie. Yeah, just so much of what you're talking about overlaps with lots of things I've been through. And I think my my drive, my inspiration, um, like most people, I suppose, who are freelance, comes from a, a you know, a drive of uh, fear and, <laughs> and terror that I might be unemployed. So that's why I don't have any problem doing multiple things to keep, you know, the money coming in. I've never been driven by money. I've never been wanted lots of money. I've never valued money because uh, Going way back, I was in a monastery, so we had a vow of poverty, and I think that's where that that comes from, which isn't a good thing in many ways because I, I you know, I, I really need to value more now. I've got a family, and it is important in many ways. But I think even as soon as I left the religious order, I, I had a need to work, and I was so scared of not being able to survive. I did countless jobs that weren't creative. I was a push by courier in London. I was a sandwich delivery person. I was a toy demonstrator in Harrods. I just had loads of jobs at the same time whilst trying to be a struggling comedian. And I was getting a lot of work as a comedian uh, pretty early on. I was quite lucky. And a pal of mine who, he, Rob Rouse, he's in Upstart Crow with Ben Elton and it's the Shakespeare um, comedy, David Mitchell. And he plays the Baldrick character. He's great. And he said to me, we did a tour of 30 universities, me, him and Paul Sinar from The Chase, the guy in the white suit. And um, and we did this tour of the country and it was so exciting. And both of them were going, you've got to give up all these other jobs. Because I was in between the tour, I'd fly back and do another couple of shifts here and there and then come back. And it wasn't 
yeah, it was years later. I was still doing all these other jobs just in case it didn't come off because I, I couldn't believe that I would be a professional. And, and it wasn't until it was physically impossible to give up the other stuff that I made the leap. And I think maybe I missed that out uh, or couldn't go into it enough in 15 minutes on my TED talk that I, I have changed lots of things but there has been a steady overlap of, of fear, of caution, of just making sure I've got all my eggs ready to, to push the other stuff. But I had, a, I had a real scare in October this year because the, the pandemic was on and the BBC changed the working systems. And I used to co-host my radio show and I'd co-hosted it since I'd started doing the breakfast show. And it was me and the journalist. And then they changed it. And when the pandemic started, they said, everyone's going to be doing one show each and it'll be four hours each. It's a longer show. So um, imagine doing a podcast for four hours a day on your own without anyone else um, with the odd guest on the phone. So it was, it was quite a shock to the system to start with. And we had to rearrange everything we did. And so the pandemic started, was it February around then? in in 2019 i've got the years now yeah. and and basically my i knew my contract was out in that october so i said to my boss you know you're going to get rid of me i'm self-employed if you're going to get rid of me i need to know what to do because all i do is this and stand-up comedy and award ceremonies and host events well all the events have gone all the comedy's gone this is my last thing so i need to know are you going to renew me? And he was going, I I'm sure we will. I'm sure we will. And then there was a problem. He was going, we want you, but there's a problem with the new way of work and the new way the BBC are doing things. So we, we can't just definitely tell you. So it got right up to October. So what I did was I went bananas drawing pictures because I thought the only other thing I can do is, is draw. So I went crackers, drawing pictures, getting a pal of mine to put a website together. So if... I didn't get renewed in October. There'd be a website where I could sell pictures and um, it got right up to October and they hadn't renewed. And then, then they did, they, they gave me a, a couple of years, uh, but it's a massive sigh of relief, but I'd never really been in that precarious uh, situation before. Loads of comedian pals of mine just have done no work. They've, they've just, and there's, there's different types. It's very interesting. Talk, when you were saying about, um, Kirsty about people who do a second job might be working in a shop and some of them have really enjoyed that as a second job it's just it's just been a total especially comedians are the most weird anti-social bunch they're honestly the comedy club dressing rooms I can't stand them because comedians can talk to comedians but they can't talk to anyone else they're no good at talking to they don't like talking to the public they don't like talking to civilians so I thought how will these people cope working in a supermarket or being a delivery driver? And I think they've just gone, wow, there's another world out there. And I don't, I've never related to it till now. So, I mean, it's all getting slowly back to normal. Some of the comedy gigs are coming back. I did one last week under the weekend before, and it still feels like a long way from packed comedy clubs that are, have great energy and, uh, and, a, and a brilliant, but it is slowly returned to normal, but I think it's it's weird how there's been two groups of people that I've observed. The ones who've thought, look, this is not going well. I've got to do something else. I'll do some Zoom comedy gigs. I'll do some charity gigs in empty theatres, which I did my fair share of them, and I'll work in a supermarket. And then there were some people who absolutely steadfastly got quite bitter and said, I am not do. I'm an artist. I didn't train. 20 years to be a comedian um to do to work in a shop but i'm i'm afraid um if it had come to it i'd have worked in a shop i think i would have been in that group i'm lucky enough that i didn't have to but i think i would have if i'd been forced to so yeah just to to recap i suppose i do like to try different things i've always needed variety in my life and I've always ended up 
sort of trying to go down one path and think, I, I want to get quite good at this and then sort of go, oh, that looks really interesting. I'll try a bit of that. And then it becomes something else. But very little of it was planned. Very little of it was a, a strategy. But it all involved tons of hard work, again, which I couldn't get into in the 15 minutes. But I, I did an unbelievable amount of gigs, free gigs to be a professional comedian. I've done loads of terrible pictures to sell one. I've done, you know, some some pretty crummy stuff on the radio till I got the job. So it, it just took a lot of hard work. I used to, my first job on the radio, um, I used to come in the show before me i used to come, come in before the guy who came in before me he said, what were you doing here i said well you've been in radio 20 years and i i'm new so i've, I've just got to prepare and he just thought i was absolutely crazy and um he's not in radio now so that, that that's that's just you know hard work it is just lots and lots of hard work and trying to learn from your mistakes and tweak stuff all the time mm. sorry one more thing um <laughs> <laughs> you, it's all from what you were saying because I was I was honestly listening to so much of what you were saying thinking I could tick that box that's true about how much you have to invest in, in things and it's very interesting because again there's a massive overlap with putting on exhibitions and having to pay for that I, I don't know about all that you're, you're doing that now because so for me the equivalent would be the Edinburgh Festival where mm. acts have to pay 10 to 15,000 pounds for the right to perform in a shipping container in a boiling hot sweat box where they might have no reviewers and they might have six people in the audience. And that's a lot of money. And I, I did go to the Edinburgh Festival years ago and I went uh, as a package show, so there was no risk. And it was me and three other stand ups and me, Mickey Flanagan, who's does arenas and everything. Paul Stinhan, it was it was brilliant. Really loved it. And then the next year, I can remember that year, a pal of mine saying he only had six people in sort of on average. That was the average figure, I think. In 2003 was about six people in the audience. It's really dispiriting if you're a comedian, you're trying to whip up a frenzy, you know. So I was going back from a gig one night and a pal of mine, James Dowdswell, said, um, you know what, you, you should do a show in your car um, because you're funnier in the car than you are on stage. He said, and so I started thinking about it. I had, work, I had an agent at the time, so I said to my agent, hey, James Dowdswell and Daniel Kitson, they said, said I should do a show in a car. He said, you, you'd have to register the car as a theatre. So I did a show. I did uh, Alfie Joy's Mini Cabaret in a red Ford Escort and we got it all um, sort of validated by the fringe. And, and I did a show and it was, it was so bizarre because I actually made a tiny bit of money when everybody else was losing thousands. And I can remember a pal of mine said, you only had six people in. And I thought I only had four people in and it was sold out because it was me car. And, and it was a hard show. It was a weird show because sometimes you'd have, literally the show was three passengers in the back and one in the front. So you never knew who quite who you're going to get. Sometimes you'd have two reviewers with the pens out and you could see them writing about you. Um, but the amount, but after that, I remember my agent said, well, next year, do it in a van. And the year after that, do it in a truck and build an audience. I went, no, I think the joke's over, Joe. I, I think I've done that show. I don't want to do it anymore. I'm not going to get anything out of it again. The surprise is gone. Um, and also, I just couldn't work out how comedians were going up there year after year, losing all of this money. And like you said, where are they getting this money? It must be mum and dad. It must be from money they're being left from someone. But I couldn't work out the finance. So I think I had to sacrifice my art, really, because I had so much other work as a comedian, because when... When the Edinburgh Festival's on, there's a lot more work for comedians down in England in that month. So I would clean up. I, I would go to Blackpool. But I would I would say I, to do that, I, I lowered my artistic standards. And that's the 
that's the balancing act, isn't it? Do you want to be a poor, pure artist or do you want to be a really busy artist who makes, gets lots of work, but it's less fulfilling, probably slightly less interesting and less credible. And I think that was a mistake I, I probably made and could have taken a few more risks. Mm. Really good points, actually. Um, and um, just, I suppose, like because all you know the, there's so many lessons kind of along the way of this kind of artistic journey and it's just trying to pick them all up along the way and put them all together so you can actually take them forward and make make the future work or make make the present work and then make the future bigger and better and brighter and um but you you've had so many changes in your career you know mm -hmm. kind of you, you said you you trained as a um a priest mm -hmm. and you know you you did um all kinds of you know, goodwill stuff, and um, you've done your presenting. You've you've done acting. You worked at Harrods in the mm -hmm. toy department. Um, you're a singer, um, presenter, comedian, artist. Um, you've you've written shows. I read um, about Monopolize, which sounded really, yeah. really interesting. <laughs> yes, it's. For, I wrote a I wrote a play for the Manchester Comedy Ke uh, Festival called. Glengarry Jonathan Ross and that was one of the best I think artistic kicks I'd ever had where there was a twist at the end of the play that I'd wrote and I was in it as well and just hearing the whole audience gasp at this twist at the end and I thought what that is one of the best feelings I've ever had because I thought I made that audience gasp um, and I knew I could make them laugh but I didn't know I could make them gasp in a dramatic way, a dramatic turn. So I thought, oh, I want to follow that up. So how can I do something more challenging? So I, I wrote a one-man musical uh, called Monopolize, and I wrote the words and the music, and a pal of mine, Mark Deeks, um, scored it for me. And I can't write music, but I knew the tunes. So I just sang them, um, and, and he wrote it down. It's just great to see all these dots on a page that I'd, I'd written. And then he, he played the piano and I played all the parts with hats and wigs. And it was about, it was a comedy musical, but it was about a serial killer on the streets of the, going around the streets of the London Monopoly board. And um, we, again, I probably did it all in the wrong order, but I learned a lot. Um, it was, again, it was one of the best things I think I've ever done artistically, because it was very original. All the songs were original. It wasn't pastiches of other, other stuff. And um, and yeah, I wrote it and performed it, but it was probably I should have done maybe a stand-up tour of the northeast on a lower scale, and then um, a musical stand-up tour, and then a, a musical that I'd written because it was just probably too much too soon. And if I did that now, it would probably be, you know, I'd have a better audience for it, and it would be more successful, more widely seen. I could then build, because my plan was, if this works, I could do, next year I could do the gangster musical or the cowboy musical or the, and, and on you go through the genres. Um, but I, I got, I just had too many other things on. As That's the other thing about doing lots of different things. The quality sometimes um, fails you and sometimes the, um, pushing an idea through to its proper conclusion sometimes just didn't get there mm -hmm. um i was sorry go on kirsty <laughs> <laughs> i think that's actually really wise words it, a lot of what you said has hit so hard home especially i mean my partner's training to become a priest he started his discipleship and oh, we're wow. getting to a point where money doesn't matter so much and the money that i do have i'm reinvesting in other artists uh, as long as i can mm. pay my bills <laughs> yeah um and we've just had a kid and you, your book that you wrote with Mike Lever, which I've got yes. right here, fantastic. Got it. I've got it. <laughs> <laughs> and it is a joy because, I mean, it's probably wrote for kids and mine yes. is not even 10 months old. And I think <laughs> I enjoy it more than she ever will because you, you can make voices and make animal noises and make it into an entire drama. <laughs> 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 do you know it, it's funny because I, I i've had a few people say oh will you draw pictures for my kids book and then you start drawing it and you realize they haven't even 
written us. Uh, but Mike sent me the words, and I went, "Oh, Mike, that's a great, that's great. I'll draw that um, straight away if I can." And it took about a month to draw the pictures, mm -hmm. and it was my wife's idea to put the spider in each picture, and um, and it makes you read the book again, which yeah. is a is a trick and I did you know again happy accident um but I didn't think the kids would say that the noises so I went into a school the other day and they asked me um it was a school teacher who on the radio this school teacher and her pals were massive Gary Barlow fans and loved to take that had been to all the gigs and so um one of them was leaving and the other one said, wouldn't it be great if Gary Barlow came to see her before she she left, just as a, as a farewell present? Well, Gary Barlow gets tons of these requests. Mm -hmm. But my producer uh, phoned his agent and his agent phoned him back. And my mate, the producer, he was having his tea. And uh, he went, it's Gary Barlow. I mean, I mean, mate's going, what? He went, it's Gary Barlow. You want me to come to the school? He went, yes, I do. Yes. Will you come? He went, yeah. And he came to the school and um, and the TV cameras are there and everything. So any of these teachers we kept in touch with, and they all went to different schools and they've all asked me to go in and read Dog's Friends. And I went in the other day and it was just a treat. So I started reading the book. I've, I've got the original pictures. Um, so I take the original pictures out and show the kids the original pictures and, and read it out to them. I didn't know they'd make all the animal sounds and the old wolf and bark. And I went, wow, I didn't know that happened. And so they went with it and it was great. And then I said, right, I'm going to draw you a picture. So I took in me a big pad of my best paper, uh, thinking I would draw a picture. So I said, um, right, what do you want me to do? Well, all the hands shot up and they're going, um, the chameleon from Tangled. Oh, an elephant. A blah. And I go, whoa, 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 one at a time. So I'm drawing all these, ripping all my paper off and just one after another, doing dead quick rubbish pictures. But they were delighted. And this little boy says, uh, could I have, um, could you draw me a perch? And I said, what, like a, a swing in a budgie cage? And he said, no, a, a fish. He was only five. And I said, a perch? Well, miss, can you look up a perch on your iPad? So she, <laughs> she shows me a perch. And uh, I drew a perch and he went, that's a perch. And I went, I know. And then he wanted another fish. I went, I can't, I've got to draw it. So I drew well, everybody's uh, fish. And then the teacher says, listen, there's another class uh, got whiffed that you're here, but they're a bit older. You wouldn't go in and do a class for them. And I said, yeah, brilliant. So I go up and, and to be honest, Dog's Friends is probably a bit um, young for them, but they went with it and they were really nice. But there, there were... A, four teachers at the back who, who looked a bit bored because I think that they, they hadn't invited me sort of thing but um so I thought oh I've got to I've got to get them on side when you're a comedian you want everybody to laugh uh, or everybody to enjoy it you can't even if there's one person not laughing it doesn't matter if everyone else is you're going to get that person who's not laughing so these teachers who are looking a bit bored at the back I thought I've got to get them on side I wonder how and then sometimes you're just riffing with kids thinking you, you know you're filling you're not quite sure where your sentence is going. If you leave a gap, they'll jump in. And I said, now imagine, and I left a gap and this kid went, that's a song by John Lennon. And I went, it is, it is a song by John Lennon. Well done. And another kid goes, and I went, yeah. And he went, would you sing us a song now? And <laughs> well, the four teachers at the back suddenly went, oh, what's he going to do? <laughs> and um, <laughs> so I thought, well, what can I sing? Because I, I can sing anything by Frank Sinatra, but I thought that well, that's not for these kids, really. So I thought, well, I've written another kid's book and I've written the theme song. So I'll sing. So I explained, it's Taxi Ted and his time traveling taxi. So I explained the concept. I said, he's a, he's a Cockney, he's a London cabbie and his taxi is right next to Big Ben and he takes people back in history through time. I said, would you like to hear the thing? They went, yeah. So I was a bit embarrassed because I hadn't gone there to sing songs, but I just charged it. And, uh, and the teachers at the end were like, whoa, well, whoa, whoa. So I got them. Yes. Felt great. But yeah, just, just to read the book in, in front of kids when you've drawn it for kids, is it's another kick. It's just um, I'm learning stuff all the time. So I'm now, I've got another book 
if I could show you, it's just, this is a dummy copy. Mm. My pal's printing it and it's called, this is the one I'm really excited about this. This is called The Last Coal Miner. And it's, um, it's all pictures. There's no um, words in it. It's a bit like the snowman. Um, and it's, it's all colour. I've got some post-it notes in there with notes. But it's, it's about two kids years after the, the pits and the coal mines had closed. Two kids um, go for a, a play on one of those big wheel memorial, mining memorials, and it starts to turn round. And then the ground before them opens and this lift comes up and there's a coal miner. And he's, I've drawn him in black charcoal there. And he's always in black and white and everything else is in colour. So he could be a ghost. He's this kind of mystery figure who doesn't speak their language. So they take him home and they've, they've got a single mum and mum is um, really intrigued. And she's a writer and she writes a short story about me, becomes famous. And but then everything goes a little bit. Um, dodgy and the kids take him back and he goes back into the earth and it's, it's quite a sad ending. My kids cried uh, when they read it first and I went, yes, it works. <laughs> I didn't want to see them cry. But anyway, so that's when I'm, I'm very excited about that, as you can hear. And that's my next, my next plan is to go into schools and, and take that one in with me and try and read that to them. That, that's amazing because I know we've got the, the Colliery Museum just up the road. And it's a strange feeling when you go, it's kind of, I don't know, it's very evocative and it, they do it so well, even kind of, you know, the, the, the setups um, yeah. of how life used to be. And it kind of, you stand there trying to put yourself in the same scene and kind of taking yourself through the, all the emotions, but kind of just looking at mm. that book, um, it, it looks like you've just captured that so, so well. Mm. And yeah, I'm a big fan of Raymond Briggs. So when you mentioned the snowman and then I saw the layout of that, I was just like, yeah. <laughs> well i've got a i've got a an amazing story that i wanted in the in the front of the book i've got a handprint a dusty coal handprint of a coal miner and um and i wanted it to be real a real coal miner's hand so i put it on my facebook page because we were in covid couldn't go anywhere so i said well does anyone know of any coal miners who live in Gateshead, ex-coal miners? And a good friend of ours whose kids go to the same school as ours go to said, oh, my stepfather who lives round, literally round the corner from you, he worked down the pit, so he would do it. So off I went round, took some um, black uh, paint and asked him for his handprint, and he's called Shuggy, lovely fella. And um, I said, which, which pit did you work down? And he worked down my dad's pit. It, uh, I couldn't believe it. I went, Vane Tempest. He went, yeah, I went, that was my dad's pit. So it was unbelievable. My dad's dead, you know. So it's sort of based on my dad. So it was just absolutely strange to, to get this handprint. And get this, he, he was 15 in the August and went down the pit all day when he was the next month and it's just imagine that when you're 15 doing that as a job when you're 15 going underground no daylight coal dust um and he said it was a horrible job but the, the camaraderie got them through it you know yeah that's fantastic i mean <laughs> it's amazing everything you've managed to do and how you've managed to juggle it all and how you're still juggling it all actually um, and it's something that I think all creatives should somehow like aspire to really and be able to make it work and enjoy what they're doing, everything that they're doing. Um, and I mean, Sarah, you've you juggle different streams of income. So I don't like saying different careers. <laughs> I'm going to coin yeah, that I phrase. Mean, they are, you know, they're, they're completely different, but I suppose you take lessons from each you know kind of I've been a therapist for 17 18 years or something and you know you 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 learn to don't deal with individuals you kind of evolve and grow with each job and there are definitely skills admin you know I hate it but you have to learn to do it accounts um as I say people skills I've learned so much about the body and health and stuff and balance and kind of looking after yourself which is really important 
as a life skill anyway, but there are some fundamentals that can be quite easily missed off. Um, so coming forward to, to being an artist, I mean, you know, I'm a hard worker as well. And sometimes you can get carried away. Joey, I'm, I'm quite sure you're the same. You can get carried away with work oh, completely. and neglect yourself. And you, you know, you kind of serve people as well, but you've kind of got to remember yourself as well. Um, but I mean, that aside, there are so many other lessons and, and skills that you carry forward throughout careers. Um, I'm sure you're the same, Kirsty. Um, I know you've done chefing a lot and uh, various yeah. other things. Um, I mean, <laughs> I, I've, I've worked hard and um, I mean, going, I went into uni five years ago, did my BA and I was literally working 70 hour weeks at the chef's job because there was yeah. five chefs doing 500 covers a night. So you had to be there every day. Um, and I was doing 60, 70 hours in the studio for my course. I was doing two or three hours sleep a night. I met my partner during that year as well. So I quickly <laughs> moved him in so I could actually see him. <laughs> um, and I mean, even recently, I'm, I was still doing 40, 50, 60 hours of chef in a week when I promised myself I was only going to do 20. Um, and I was being an artist. And during the pandemic, I just started up the gallery and, and all the projects and exhibitions and everything else it runs and book yeah. publishing. And I, about a month ago, I, I've always neglected myself. I've never really asked for help. And it got to one point where I was off for, um, for a week because I had an accident, um, which flared up my back. And I walked into the, my first shift back and I went, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to look after myself. I, mm. This strain is not good on me anymore. And I walked out, um, which I probably shouldn't say in public because <laughs> that's not a good practice to do. Um, but I think so, when you get really busy and you've done it for a long time and you you are more prone to injuries and problems you realize that you need to step back and do what you love for a little bit and I have no clue where it's going to take me I have the fear <laughs> will it work or will it not <laughs> who knows um and it's the first time in my life that I don't have a backup so wow. we're seeing how it goes <laughs> um yeah you can do it <laughs> I can <laughs> Currently, all of your careers are pretty much creative, um, and but some of them are more out there than others. So your your drawing practice, I, sp I suppose, if you're like us, it'll be quite solitary. Um, is the one that you prefer, or do you find they kind of balance each other and it kind of gives you a more um, rounded life? I guess it, it's it's interesting. I've um... I think I've fallen in love with the radio all over again. I'm really enjoying it um, at the minute, um, that's, which is great. But the, the drawing is, it's almost my um, yoga, my um, <laughs> a sort of calm, spiritual side of things. You know, it fills that void. It calms me down. It keeps me sane. And um, so I don't see it as, as stressful. I love it. I mean, that's been the tendency to, to fall in love with whatever is the new sort of creative thing. So the art is at the minute, just I'm, I'm absolutely loving it. Um, I suppose the, the thing that I, it's just been a strange year in so many ways, but one of them is the, the hardest thing I suppose I have to do is nighttime gig, not comedy gigs, but awards, shows, hosting events and things like that. And I'm, I just, can't return to them um and I, mean, I get booked to do loads of them and it's obviously something i can do but it's that to me is the hardest work because because it's at night and i've got up at three or four in the morning and it's it's not so much doing the actual event but you've got to have a two-hour dinner with um a load of strangers and and be dead chirpy and cheerful and then then host the awards or whatever so I, I think that is definitely something I've not missed but again happy accident this year because I've had more time at home and I've had more 
less less late nights doing that i've had so much more time to draw so it's it's all sort of worked perfectly this year yeah and kind of maybe this will be a hard one to answer i don't maybe it'd be really easy but kind of you are a man of so many talents if you could only hang on to one of them talents for life which would it be i think i think now drawn because i've i've i think um it's the one I've done least and the one I regret not doing for, and I, and I say this to kids and that's a, that's the next book I want to do after the coal miner one gets out there. I want to do a semi autobiographical book called don't stop drawing because I did, I didn't really draw from, you know, I've always doodled and done the odd little thing, but nothing substantial from about the age of 20 to the age of 50. So that that was that was crazy and it was just what a shame and when when so many people said to me oh i'd love to be able to draw like that i i could you could because I, I just didn't do it for 30 years i'm sure if you wanted to it, it could happen but you've got to just sit down and do it and just try and tweak and improve each time you do it because look at what most kids draw when their little looks pretty similar you just evolve and you just you just tweak it and get better each time but most people don't want to again put the work in but yeah I think if I could only have one it would be art I think because it's the one I've tried least I've done comedy for 20 odd years I've done um, radio for 12 12 plus years and just this for a couple of years now yeah that's cool and is there any is is there a kind of a creative gene in your family um you know is, is it something that you've been inspired kind of by you know your mum and dad or kind of you know any other family um, members or? no i mean i was a very working class family so there was a great work ethic from my mother more than my dad me my mum was a real hard work my mum always had three jobs so that that's very similar to but my mum would come in and then go back out to do another job and come back in and go back out to do another job on the same day sometimes. So I, I have a similar style of living in some ways. And my dad was very much into the arts. He loved, he loved um, really good movies. So he used to talk me through, uh, for, he was like my DVD commentary. He used to say, this is a really good film and tell me what was good about it. And, and he also gave me an appreciation for, um, current affairs. We watch the news all the time. He explained the news. Of course, we were in the miners' strike, so I remember all that. So that that's really held me in good stead for the radio because I'm not a trained journalist, but in in many ways, my dad was was doing that um, from a very early age. I was very socially aware, um, and I suppose I, I think they never said no to any of the odd things I wanted to do. You know, I wanted to be a priest when I was seven and they never rubbished it or it wasn't what kids my age in that sort of area wanted to do, but they just, you do, will support whatever you want to do. And while they weren't particularly arty or anything, if I did it, they were fine with it. And I, you know, can't ask for more. That's yeah. so phenomenal to be able to grow up with. So, I mean, so many people don't get that. And yeah, it's yeah. so nice to hear that you were one of the lucky ones, really. Yeah, but you'll do the same now with, with yes. your child. And, and that's that's it. It's the way it should be, isn't it? Mm, definitely. Um, and your drawing skill actually leads us on to the next thing, our final art challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got no clay I've got no don't pottery show us up. don't show us yes. up <laughs> it's fine we kept it simple this week paper pens sharpies whatever's yeah. around you so do we have a theme do you have the, the roulette wheel first do you or yes oh, we're going to wing it <laughs> well um, it's up to you I do have the roulette wheel if you'd like to use it where is it? Let's see if I've broken it again or not. <laughs> I have about 20 wires on it, so which... Sometimes we do actually do some planning. Sometimes yes. we go, you know, we'll just abandon them plans and just go for it. <laughs> <laughs> right, so we've got a roulette wheel and we spin it and wherever the red arrow... Oh, it disappears. It's a disappearing roulette wheel. 
wherever the red arrow hits is what we are doing or what the theme is. So let's hope this doesn't break. This is only broken twice in 12 episodes. So fingers crossed. <laughs> we won't knew you could be drawing with your feet. <laughs> we have just missed it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> We've got the theme of animal. So I think, okay. we can make, shall we make a storyboard about an animal? Okay. Can we do, okay. can we do that in five minutes? <laughs> Let's go for it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and right. Sarah is so, our in-house DJ. <laughs> yes. Well, kind of. Like, hang on. Let's see. Oh, goodness. I'll just minimize the screen there. So, because I know that you're a fan of Frank Sinatra, <laughs> I thought I'd dig up some Frank Sinatra. <laughs> oh yes, please. <laughs> this is. <laughs> It was going so well. <laughs> <laughs> I think, Sarah, we should see what you've done. What have you been up to? <laughs> I don't know what happened to my sunset after last week. <laughs> <laughs> so with the emphasis on really bad art. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is... A story about a pig. <laughs> a pig. I love the pig. <laughs> Who makes a French a chicken. <laughs> I thought that was a penguin. <laughs> <laughs> it was fine until I started colouring in. <laughs> You're the animal artist. And the sun starts to set. Now the pig... <laughs> The pig and the penguin, the pig and the chicken, don't see the muddy puddle. And oh no. darker and darker, they just don't see it all. And then they fall into the muddy puddle. <laughs> Brilliant. It's available in all good bookshops now. Or all <laughs> really bad bookshops. <laughs> That's all right. Like Peppa Pig says, everybody loves muddy puddles. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, mine um I think you have to be a cat person to um think how much of a genius I am I have done a autobiography of what I get usually at three in the morning then five in the morning then seven in the morning and then about six <laughs> times during the day that I can't recall I've done it in four little parts so Ooh. the cat goes meow I love you mummy and it goes meow with a head bonk and it goes <laughs> give me attention <laughs> it gets on my lap and goes <laughs> it goes that feels good and it goes but to the face <laughs> <laughs> to which I say that is very clean well done <laughs> I think I think you might be the winner <laughs> what have you done oh, Alfie <laughs> this is my uh animal cartoon strip so this is kind of fitted in this is called lieutenant monkey crooner and he's a hard bitten cop but he's also a crooner by night there he is reading in the new york post banana burglary in the big city and who has taken all the bananas well our lieutenant knows he points down and there's the usual suspect but it is clearly the embarrassed hippopotamus with all of the bananas <laughs> at his feet. So back at night, he can celebrate by singing, I'm bananas over this, bananas over this. Ta -da. <laughs> well done. That's fantastic. First to shame. <laughs> oh, not at all. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that, that was fantastic. It's been so great to have you on, Alfie, and to learn more about you. Total pleasure, absolute pleasure. And I look forward to I always catch up on old podcasts, so I'll be going back listening through your archives as well. It'd be great. <laughs> yeah, it's a great so, look. very well done. Thank Good you. That's real, I think. Soon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, hopefully, it should be up in 24 hours, but it depends if I fall asleep after this or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but 
yeah so everyone make sure you follow alfie on instagram facebook um what are your tags alfie joy linkedin um yeah alfie Ooh. joy on nearly everything i think it's alfie joy art on instagram but there you are easy to find <laughs> easy to <Yeah>. remember <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so just really, thank you so much alfie it's been an absolute pleasure um having you on the show and yeah just being able to chat and find out more and kind of yeah just seeing you draw live like that it's just like mind-blowing that a story could just i just went blank i just <laughs> And then I, I lost the ability to control the pen. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us. Total pleasure. Thanks again. Um, and please make sure all of you watching this on Catch Up to like, comment, share, follow, and all the other jazz that happens on all the other me media's tweets. Um, and help, just help us support us and push us up a little bit more. Um, so thank you so much for being here tonight, Alfie. And thank you so much to those of you watching live and those of you watching on Catch Up. And I hope you have a good day and enjoy the very sunny weather that we are having at the moment. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> so we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Oh, that's my Frank Sinatra t-shirt. Yes. There you go. <laughs> see ya. See ya. Take care.